The sun radiates heat and light energy in all directions and this is what is known as solar radiations. The amount of solar radiation reaching a given area is called insulation. The flow of energy from the sun to the earth and then into the space is a complex process and this involves energy transmission, storage and transport. Now energy transmission means sun is transmitting energy in the form of radiations and radiation here is emission of energy in the form of electromagnetic waves or moving subatomic particles whereas energy storage and transport occurs in the form of heat. Now solar radiation is the only primary source of light and heat on the earth. The earth receives its heat from solar radiation which is a tiny fraction of the radiated energy of the sun. The sun's radiation is made up of three parts. First one is the white light which has the seven colors. Second infrared. Infrared is the heat of the sun which is not visible. Third is the ultraviolet rays. The sun also emits atomic particles and these are called solar wind. Most of the particles of the solar wind are charged electrons and this can harm planet earth. But we are protected from the solar wind by the magnetic field around the earth. Life exists on earth in different forms. The energy needed for all movement and change on the earth is provided by the sun. Everything in nature is moving in cycles and one thing is permanent on earth and that is change. Let us understand solar radiation. Now the earth is geod in shape and it resembles a sphere. So different part of the earth receives different amount of sunlight and heat. The sun's rays fall vertically at the equator and the angle of incidence increases as we move towards the poles. We can say the rays of the sun become more and more oblique as we move towards the poles. The duration for which the sun's rays would fall also vary from equator towards poles. The top of the atmosphere and the earth obstructs a very small portion of sun's energy. On an average, the earth receives 1.94 calories of heat per square centimeter per minute at the top of the atmosphere. We know that the earth revolves around the sun in an elliptical orbit. An ellipse is an elongated circle. The sun is not at the center of the ellipse. So there is variations in the distance between the earth and the sun. During its revolution around the sun, the earth is furthest from the sun that is 152 million kilometers on 4th July. This position of the earth is called epihelion. On 3rd January, the earth is nearest to the sun that is 147 million kilometers and this position is called perihelion. Therefore, the annual insulation received by the earth on 3rd January is slightly more than the amount received on 4th July. However, the effect of this variation in the solar output is covered up by other factors like the distribution of land and sea and the atmospheric circulation. Hence, this variation in the solar output does not have effect on daily weather changes on the surface of the earth. Now, let us study the variability of insulation 
at the surface of the earth. Now the amount and the intensity of insulation vary during a day, in a season and in a year. The factors that cause these variations in insulation are first one is the rotation of the earth on its axis. Then it is the angle of inclination of the sun's rays. Third is the length of the day. Fourth, the transparency of the atmosphere. And the fifth is the configuration of land in terms of its aspect. Talking about the first one, the rotation of the earth on its axis. Now, because of the rotation of the earth, in some part it is day and another part it is night. Not only that, the earth is continuously rotating. It completes one rotation in nearly 24 hours. And in different part of the earth, the weather conditions, the time of the day is different. So, we can say there is variation in insulation. Then it is the angle of inclination of the rays. This depends on the latitude of a place. Higher the latitude, the less is the angle they make with the surface of the earth resulting in slant sun rays. The area covered by vertical rays is always less than the slanting rays. If more area is covered, the energy gets distributed and the net energy received per unit area decreases. Moreover, the slant rays are required to pass through greater depth of the atmosphere resulting in more absorption, scattering and diffusion. Third is the transparency of the atmosphere. The atmosphere is largely transparent to shortwave solar radiations. So the sun's radiation that we receive are short waves because they directly come and hit the surface of the earth. And when I say the atmosphere is largely transparent, I am saying that the atmosphere has clarity in it. The atmosphere is in continual motion with changing temperature, air currents or wind and weather fronts causing stars to twinkle. The incoming solar radiation passes through atmosphere before striking the earth's surface. Within the troposphere, the water vapor, ozone and other gases absorb much of the near-infrared radiation. When I say near-infrared radiation, it is the heat received from the sun. Very small suspended particles in the troposphere scatter visible spectrum both to the space and towards the earth's surface and this process adds color to the sky. The red color of the rising and the setting sun and the blue color of the sky are the result of scattering of the light within the atmosphere. Fourth is the length of the day. The earth's axis makes an angle of 66 and a half degrees with the plane of its orbit round the sun and has a greater influence on the amount of insulation received at different latitudes. Now each and every day on the planet earth at different places there is variation in the length of day and night. This is because of the revolution of the earth around the sun with an inclined axis. And to understand it better, watch the video given in the link. Next is the configuration of the land in terms of its aspect. Now this depends on the latitude of a place. Higher the latitude, the less is the angle they make with the surface of the earth resulting in slant sun rays. The area covered by the vertical rays is always less than the slant rays, which we have already studied. But these last two points however, have less influence. Now, to summarize the spatial distribution of insulation at the Earth's surface, first of all, we need to understand the insulation received at the surface varies from about 320 Watt per square meter in the tropics 
to about 70 watt per square meter in the poles. So it reduces towards the poles. Maximum insulation is received over the subtropical deserts because they lie in the high pressure belts. So in the high pressure belts, they, they are cloudless and the sky is clear. So the insulation is maximum. At the equator, it is the other way around. It is a low pressure area. And during the daytime, because the rate of evaporation is high, most of the time the sky is covered with clouds. So the insulation is less than the tropics. Generally in the equatorial region, at the same latitude, the insulation is different on the continent and different on the oceans. In winter, the middle and the higher latitudes, when I say middle latitudes, it is areas around 30 degrees and higher latitudes means areas around 60 degrees and more receive less radiation than in summer.